Bienvenue sur ma chaîne, welcome to my channel. This is Tina Hitane here and today we are going to be addressing summary judgment. So I'm only going to be addressing for the applicant because I've never actually done the respondent. I know a professional a practicing lawyer would probably be better at teaching this, but um, this is from a student's perspective. And so the first question you are probably all asking is what on earth is summary judgment? People get very confused what it is. In a nutshell, in my own words, it's basically when you are applying to the court to, to prevent a case from going to trial. Therefore, the court will make a judgment and it will save a lot of time and money and stress. You're applying to the court to get something prevented from going to trial because you do not think that the opposition has a strong enough case and that you just want the you just want the judge to quickly make a decision and finalize it so it doesn't have to proceed to trial. So you're you're trying to get something prevented from going to trial. So everything is decided there. So it's basically you're going to be adducing this based on the same evidence or lack of evidence. And it's most of the time the claimant that is the applicant sometimes it is the defendant that will apply but most of the time it's the claimant and this rule for summary judgment can be found in the civil procedure rules you guys know the cpr the civil uh, procedure rule 24.2 and i'm going to read it out for you it says pursuant to the cpr rule 24.2 the applicant has the burden of showing that the claimant has no real prospect of succeeding on the claim or issue in question, or the defendant has no real prospect of successfully defending the claim or issue in question, and that there are no compelling reasons why there ought to be a trial. So you as the applicant are trying to persuade the judge that the opposition has no real prospect or there's no other compelling reason why the case should go to trial. If you persuade the judge, then he will grant summary judgment. If you don't do a good job at persuading the judge and the opposition does a better job at persuading the judge that their arguments and their issues in question need to go to trial, then the judge is going to let the case go to trial and your summary judgment won't be granted. And regardless if you are the claimant or the defendant, the opposition is always going to be arguing the opposite. So it really comes down to the evidence or the lack of evidence and really putting forward your case and discrediting the other side it's like any other mood in that sense however it is not a trial this is not litigation but this is a judgment that happens to prevent something from going to trial. So really it is at the discretion of the judge and how strong your evidence is or how weak the opposition's evidence is or etc. It's really about who has the stronger argument, who is going to be most persuasive according to the evidence that is presented and really it's up to the judge after hearing both sides whether they think that the matter needs to go to trial or the matter can be just decided right then and there. So next, obviously I can't talk about the case or anything that I did um, at uni. I am, um, oh sorry, for those of you who don't know, I am a law graduate, UK law graduate, and I am at the University of Law, and I am studying the LLM LPC, so I am doing a joint master's and legal practice course, and I have catered my electives to international commercial law. So I will be talking about the process of summary judgment and basically help you guys how to get through one. I'm not talking about the details of the case, I'm not permitted to talk about my answers to the case, but we are going to be speaking generally about how to structure your argument um, for summary judgment for the applicant. And if this interests you, keep watching. So, at our uni, for summary judgment, because it's COVID, we've been doing them via Zoom and you are given an advocacy assessment criteria to kind of help you see how you will be judged 
um, whether you are making the interim application or opposing the interim application, there are a set of guidelines to see where you should be, what, you know, what areas you should be really working on to improve. And as you are basically given a list of things that you will be judged on. And this goes down to how you dress. Please dress appropriately. It may sound superficial, this and that, but it's law. You're supposed to be a lawyer, even though you're not a lawyer yet. It's a professional course and you are expected to behave and to act like you're already there because it's professional. It's unprofessional if you just show up slobby in your ripped t-shirt with pizza stains from the night before, hair all messy and you appear in the courtroom like that. You have to have a basic level of courtroom etiquette and courtroom respect. So dress appropriately, wear something that you would wear if you were actually going to appear before a judge. This is actually the exact outfit I wore uh, for my summer I'm such a dog, I know. I, at least I, I can show you live. This is actually what I wore for my interim application for my summer judgment. Um, this is an Anne Fontaine like corporate kind of mock dress. It's got these white button sleeves. You can change the sleeves and collars out. But as you can see, it looks very lawyery. I wore pearls because it's a subtle kind of jewelry. You don't wear, want to wear anything flashy. You don't want to wear anything too colorful and too loud. You're supposed to be professional, so stick to dark colors like black and white. <laughs> Especially when you're in England, um, it's even more conservative than it is uh, in the American courts. So no huge earrings and jewellery and flashy things. Do not dress like you're going clubbing. You're going to court. So dress appropriately. Um, I wore my hair back. If you have very big, huge, cumbersome, uh, just huge mass and shock of hair like me, you need to tame it when you enter the courtroom so i usually would pin my hair back in like a low french bun or something like that and at the university of law they're actually really really good all the materials are very digestible and they do give you a student's guide to the skill of advocacy and the assessment criteria this is like my advocacy bible it's so easy to get through and it's really well laid out, very organized, and very easy to understand. So I highly suggest that you really get to know this booklet before you start on the actual case. There's a practice assessment and then your real assessment. They are exactly the same format, the same way, except one doesn't count toward your grade and obviously this assessment counts toward your grade. So I'm just going to be going through with you generally how to get through a summary judgment. So you are not allowed to take in anything except the case itself it's about 21 pages i know it sounds a lot but like a lot it's it's not um half of it is witness statements in particulars and things like that um get to know the case really well i like to give myself at least four days four days is really good if you are consistently going through the case and really getting it in your head absorbing everything you don't want to be going into this not knowing the details off by heart you really should know all the details and all the salient points of the case and things pertinent to the case like the facts and the dates by heart because if you don't and you are relying on reading something you're going to get totally lost during the assessment because when you are actually doing the assessment you're you're on a strict time limit. You have 10 minutes to get your whole submission in. And, and that's not a lot of time at all because the judge has to question you and you have to answer the judge and you have to also be doing the introduction. So as an applicant, whenever you are the applicant, you are, you are the one that has to introduce the parties. It's no. you. Not the respondent. Yeah, it's you. So I will be going through the sequence that I go through. You don't have to be doing exactly what I do. This is just a very generalized, basic template that to I help you organize it in your head and know 
how to really get through one. So as the applicant, you do have to introduce yourself and everyone else. So this is what I wrote, like bullet points. Good morning or good afternoon. According to the time your, your case is going to be, usually in the morning. So good morning, sir or madam, lordship, ladyship, depends on master, depends on the judge and what kind of judge and what court you are in. So you're going to address the judge, that's the first thing. Good morning, sir, madam. Then you introduce yourself. I am Tina Hitana of, of the solicitors you are part of, of Nova and Nova solicitors. I act for the claimant, or I act, yeah, I act for the claimant, so-and-so introduce a claimant. Then you introduce the opposition. Always my friend. If your barrister is its learned friend, do not use learned friend if you are not on the bar, you're not going to be a barrister because only barristers say learned. So if you're a solicitor, you are basic, so you, you're just a friend. <laughs> so my friend, okay, we'll actually use Nova against Finley, okay. My friend of Finley and Company, okay appears for the defendant or acts on behalf of the defendant or appears on behalf of the, basically acts for the defendant and then you can list the defendant's name mr german shepherd madam. then you address the judge again this isn't the way you address the judge like if it's so madam you're going to be using that term throughout the whole case it's not just in the beginning it's throughout the whole case so so madam this is then you introduce the act the application itself. This is an application for summary judgment for a debt action or breach of contract or whichever it is, whichever it may be. Tell the judge why you're there. This is an application for so-and-so. Summary judgment. You're going to briefly explain why. Like this is an application for summary judgment for breach of contract that the defendant owes the claimant three million dollars plus accrued interest because of blah 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 so it's short really it shouldn't be more than a sentence so i'm going to repeat this again so address the judge sir mom madam this is an application for summary judgment for breach of contract or whatever it may be that the defendant owes the claimant or the da -da 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 -da, whatever it is you're explaining to the judge why you are applying, what you're applying for, why you are applying, and what you want out of it. The defendant owes the claimant this amount of money because of this. Safe. Nova is suing Finley because Finley was supposed to provide Nova with five boxes of dog bones and they weren't fit for purpose. So then that's when you would kind of say it in there, like just kind of want to list what was wrong, kind of explaining why there was a breach of contract in a short sentence, that's it. Next, ask the judge whether they would like a brief summary of the facts of the case. Most of the time they say no, sometimes they'll say yes, but be prepared on them saying yes, because you, if you keep, if you just assume, oh, they won't ask, this is barely any time, they're not gonna ask me, you're gonna be so screwed. If they say yes and you're like, um, well, you know, and then you're like fumbling through your papers and you're trying to summarize what happened, or like 24 pages of what happened in a sentence. You wanna keep this very short because this is infringing on your time if you go, if you ramble on too long. Literally have a short sentence um, or have a short paragraph. I write, everything I'm going to say on the laptop and just kind of go through it and get it in my head so I, my mind maps out the sequence of things. So I wrote a short paragraph of the, the whole summary of the case. Basically, you want to list the dates. Well, on July 1st, a contract was created between the claimant and the defendant to supply this many boxes of dog bones then on September so-and-so 
when the, when the bones arrived, they weren't fit for purpose and they were all damaged and da 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 da. Um, and then anything else that's pertinent to, to giving leverage to your case. Defendant breached the contract, what they did wrong. So therefore you are owed this amount of money. Make it very quick and short, okay. After the brief summary, or she can just say no. So if she says no, so but just remember that's when you ask for the brief summary of the facts of the case. Then you go into the legal issue and the factual issue. You don't tell the judge, but you tell the judge that they're supposed to decide, that that's what they need to decide today. You are guiding the judge of what they need to decide. So, sir or madam, the legal issue for you to decide today is whether... The, so the, the first thing is generalized. It's always going to be the same if you are applying for summary judgment, you are the claimant. The first, the legal issue for you to decide today is whether the defendant has a real prospect of successfully defending their claim at trial, or if there is any other compelling reason why the issue must go to, to, to court. So you have to remember two things within the legal issue, whether there's a real prospect or whether there's a, an, any other compelling reason why the issue should, should proceed to trial. That's always going to be the same. Then the factual issue is catered to the individual facts of your case. Whether the contract was valid, whether the defendant actually breached, okay, for example, like, oh, whether the defendant was responsible for the state of the bones during the process of delivery or the storage or whatever. The, those intricacies that you are arguing that the defendant did wrong, that's where you should list the factual issue, the issue in question. They're obviously arguing on a certain issue. Defendant says he didn't breach. The claimant says he did breach. So this is where you're going to list the factual issues. So it's the main issues that you are actually arguing in your argument itself. And then after that, you go into your submissions. So, okay, first of all, I'm going to, I, I use these tabs. Tabs are so, so important when you are mooting. I even rearrange my case in order of my argument, even if it's not the correct order that it came in, because the order that it came in doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be doing that. You can rearrange the case as long as it's in a good chronological order in your argument, because the case isn't going to necessarily be in order of your argument. So I arrange it so that it's going from front to back, that I'm not jumping from back and forth and back and forth and getting really mixed up between my pages. And tabs are so, so important. I cannot stress to you the importance of tabs. I, I always go from top to bottom. So I know then like this is my first submission. This is my second submission. This is my third submission. Then this is my fourth submission. And then I'll have, some bullet points to wrap it up just to kind of help me wrap it up so you want to use the evidence like witness statements especially like like i've showed you before you want to make your number your witness statement the paragraphs very large those are the ones that you're going to refer to generally you don't really need to spend too much time or not even at all referring to the particulars i mean the judge has everything in front of them but don't assume that they also know everything you're talking about either if there's something pertinent in the particulars that you just kind of want to reiterate to support your argument but you don't want to be using that as in, as evidence or whatever use the actual evidence as evidence like the witness statements so I like to tab and I will just rearrange everything so that the tabs go in order so you're not going from front and then back. And then Say if it's in the order that it's in, but it's not in the order of your argument, you're going to be going back and forth and back and forth. You just want to go, once you turn the page, you're never going to turn back again. Page, page, page to the end. You know what I mean? So tab, tabbing is so important. And this is what I do. 
when I use a paragraph, I will write in large numbers the number of paragraph that is. Even if the number, even if the nu it's already you numbered, this. and you're under that kind of pressure, you don't. Things just glaze over. So you want to have it in bright. So I use like a bright blue highlighter to number my paragraphs. So I can easily refer to you. like. So, madam, may I please take you to paragraph seven, eight? So it's I'm not really having to search. I just see it, it's almost in my peripheral revision because it's so large. So that's really important. And then you just want to highlight, and sometimes you can you can do bullet points and short phrases, like abbreviation phrases, but you cannot write full sentences anywhere. And you do have to show your paper. Um, in person, your judge will be right in front of you so they can see everything anyway. But if you're doing by if you're doing it by Zoom, then you have to show the table in front of you. The camera has to be on the table and you so they can see exactly what you're looking at. And they're really keeping an eye on you. If they even catch you reading verbatim, you're not actually speaking or you're looking down or something, you can fail because you're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to write a script out and just this and that. That's why they don't let you take in any extra papers. Right beside the paragraph of the main issue that I'm arguing and then everything will come to my head. Like, oh, I remember th those details. So I'm not actually needing to read the actual paragraph to know the details for the judge. I already know them, but I will write something beside it to kind of jog my memory. So I will put like a star in thick black um, ink, like this wasn't mentioned or so-and-so was never discussed. And then I'll remember like what what the main issue is that really give your case leverage and really discredit the opposition. Often they will say things that discredit the, themselves and you're like, oh, that helps me. Show the judge that it's unreliable and have evidence and a good reason referring to the law and the evidence before the judge of why the defendant's argument should not be relied upon. You just want to destroy the points, basically, and make your points look really reliable and very credible and good. That's what it is. The end is important, I think, because I think that's usually where I'm, I really kind of hone in on my arguments. I think, I think your closing statement doesn't have to be long, can be very persuasive, and make a large impact. So anyway, I hope I've helped some of you. I'm sorry that I may not be the best at explaining these things, but I tried and I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye.